Hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope you've all had a great week. Today's video is going to be a pretty crazy one. It's going to be very violent and just overall bizarre in a lot of ways. Synanon had veered so far away from its original message and Chuck Dieterich just continued to spiral out of control. And eventually the cult became involved in multiple murder plots and one of them has got to be up there with one of the weirdest I've ever heard. Today is of course part two of the Synanon cult case. In part one, we mainly focused on the history of the group, where it all started, Chuck Dieterich himself, and we talked a lot about the psychological abuse of the members. Today's video will be all about the violence and some of the murder plots that Synanon was involved in. Chuck Dieterich had just gone completely off the rails and we're gonna get into all of that today. If you haven't watched part one, I will link it right here and in the description box. I would go ahead and go watch that one first before you watch this one, you're probably gonna be pretty lost if you don't. Okay, we have a lot to talk about today, so let's just go ahead and jump in. But first, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, MD Hair. So about six months after the birth of my third son, I developed an anxiety disorder pretty much out of nowhere. This is something that I had never dealt with before, so I knew I was gonna to have to learn ways to cope with this huge burden that was suddenly in my life. I knew that I'd have to make some changes, I'd have to probably adjust my diet, exercise more, maybe do yoga. But what I didn't realize at the time was that the health of my hair would also suffer. The shedding that I started to experience was concerning. And it's something that's been an on and off issue for me ever since. So when I heard about MD Hair, I was very interested. MD Hair is the world's first medical grade hair regrowth treatment customized to the exact cause and type of hair loss a person is experiencing. You just go to their website, take a short quiz, and they'll recommend the best kit for you based on your answers. You can even upload a photo of your scalp to the website to get an analysis of your specific type of hair loss and the results are instant. And it was no surprise to me that my issues stem from stress. After you take your quiz, you'll receive a box with all the products that are best suited for you. It's all backed by science and formulated with FDA approved medical and botanical ingredients to deliver the best possible results. And there are more than 100 natural ingredients in these products. In my box, I received custom shampoo and conditioner, hair care serum, vitamins, and collagen. And I've only been using MD hair for a few weeks, so I haven't gotten the full effect of everything, but I can tell you that my hair already feels better. It's just softer, it's smoother. I've noticed that it's laying down better. I live in a very humid climate. It doesn't take much for my hair to just turn into a ball of frizz, but I definitely feel like this has helped with that. My frizz has been noticeably reduced. The vitamins and collagen were super simple to incorporate into my daily routine. I get up and eat breakfast, I take my vitamin, then I add the collagen to my morning cup of coffee before I head out to work for the day. And one of the best things about MD hair is that all of their products are cruelty free, sulfate free, paraben free, phthalate free, and they're packed in recyclable packaging. But my favorite thing about MD hair is that they offer free 24 seven one on one medical chat support with dermatologists and registered nurses. That's how committed MD hair is to ensuring that you get exactly what you need to treat or prevent hair loss. You can check the comments or the description box of this video and follow the link to customize your own hair regrowth treatment. Use my promo code summer 70 to get 70% off your first month of customized products. Thank you so much to MD Hair for sponsoring this video and now let's jump back into the case. So before we get started, I do want to point out that some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today kind of overlaps a little bit with stuff that we talked about in part one. I just wanted to mention that there are some things that are happening simultaneously to the stuff that I talked about in part one. So by the 1970s, Synanon had become a religion and they were now the church of Synanon. This was mostly done just to keep their tax exempt status. There were about 1700 members living in different Synanon locations and they were mostly working and handing their money over to Chuck. The organization was now worth millions and they had several locations. Santa Monica, Oakland, San Francisco, Badger, California, and of course, Tamales Bay, which we talked about in part one. They actually ended up having more locations than this by the end, but these are the ones that are most mentioned. So as we all know by now, Chuck Diederich founded Synanon on three main rules, no alcohol, no drugs, and absolutely no violence. But as time went on and Chuck started to realize what kind of hold he had over the cult, that last role just got completely thrown out the window. Soon, members weren't just allowed to use violence, they were actually encouraged to use violence. And it would be inflicted on people inside and outside of the cult. There are a couple of incidents that happened in the 70s that kind of marked the beginning of this change in Synanon. One of them happened on a night in 1973 during a session of the game. So among the people taking part in this particular session of the game was Chuck and Betty and this woman named Lillian Fishman. Lillian has been 
been described as being a middle-aged square. And remember, a square is the term that the Synanon people used for people who were a part of Synanon but didn't have any sort of addiction issue. So during this session of the game, Lillian and Betty kind of started to go at it a little bit, and Lillian was said to be extremely annoying. She kept interrupting Betty. Betty was trying to explain something to her and she just wasn't listening. Which remember, by Chuck's own rules, this is totally allowed. You can say anything you want to during the game. You just can't get violent and you can't threaten violence. So Lillian was totally within her rights to be as annoying as she wanted to be. But as time kept going on and Lillian kept getting more and more obnoxious, Chuck started to get angry and eventually he got involved. He pretty much told Lillian that she just needed to back off and then Lillian and Chuck kind of started arguing back and forth a little bit and then finally Lillian said quote it's my game too. So in response to all this Chuck walks over to Lillian and dumps a can of dad's old-fashioned root beer on her head and it was like the record stopped in that room. It just fell completely silent. Everyone was just shocked. They could not believe what Chuck had just done. Nothing like this had ever happened during a session of the game. So news of this incident traveled really fast throughout all of the Synanon facilities. The members started to get a little worried. They were wondering what the implications were here. You know, is there a shift in the game? Are we not allowed to say certain things anymore? People just felt kind of uneasy. The game had always been a place for people to go in and vent and let out their frustrations, let out their feelings, and they were allowed to say whatever they wanted to say. And you could say anything you wanted to anyone, even Chuck himself. So people were starting to get really worried. But then Chuck came over the wire and he tells everyone, you know, I'm really sorry that this happened. I shouldn't have done that. You know, that was kind of out of line. And after that, people started to calm down a little bit. But then just a couple of hours later, he comes back on the wire and rescinds his apology and says that Lillian had it coming and that she needed a lesson in manners. And people kind of mark this incident as the day that the game died. People were suddenly really nervous about the game. They didn't really know, you know, what they were allowed to say anymore. So people started to get demoted and just thrown out of Synanon if they said something that Chuck didn't like, especially if it was said against someone that Chuck deemed valuable. There were a lot of lifestylers in Synanon at this point and Chuck started to value them more than the people that had been in Synanon for years. There were doctors and lawyers in the group now. This is kind of where Chuck's priorities were at this point. And there were actually a lot of original members that ended up leaving when all this started. But it was Chuck's development of a new group group that he called the punk squad that really marked the beginning of the violence in Synanon. One day there were 10 boys that were considered troublemakers within the Synanon school and Chuck had them shipped out to Tamales Bay and they were to be the first members of the punk squad. And I do just want to give a note here. We are going to be talking about child abuse from this point on. It'll just kind of be mentioned randomly throughout this video. So the punk squad was basically just a group of troubled kids within Synanon. That's how it started at least. They were sent to the Tamales Bay location and they were forced to do drills and it was almost like a boot camp that they were put through. But eventually Chuck decided to reach out to the courts and probation officers in the area. He offered to let troubled teens within the community join the punk squad and it could be like a form of rehabilitation. They would accept any kid between the age of 10 and 18 into the punk squad and they told the courts that they would put them through this boot camp and help to rehabilitate them and make them upstanding members of society. So they started taking in these new kids but these kids were from outside. They hadn't been raised in Synanon, so they were not eager to stay. They had no ties to this place. They wanted out. They were only there because they had either been sent by the courts or by their parents because they were just deemed out of control. So these kids that were sent to Synanon, they were more challenging than the original 10 that started the punk squad. And the people that were put in charge of this program had no clue what they were doing. They had no experience dealing with this kind of thing. So Chuck's answer was to use a heavy hand when dealing with these kids. He started encouraging the others to just beat the kids whenever they got out of line. And this is kind of the point when that rule just completely got broken. And once it finally was broken and violence was allowed in the punk squad, it just kind of spread throughout all of Synanon. And soon violence just became a theme within the cult. Chuck said, quote, we built our punk squad on the position of violence by the simple device of saying the hell with the nonviolent approach. Every time a kid sasses you, 
knock him on his ass. When a kid gets out of line, they are knocked on their asses. That treatment turns them into woolly lambs in about a week. So a little bit after the punk squad had been formed and these boys had been taken to Tamales Bay, they one day just show up in Santa Monica. Some of the Santa Monica kids had been called out to the basketball courts and they were just kind of standing outside to see what was happening. All of a sudden the punk squad appears and they're doing marching drills. So the Santa Monica kids are just kind of hanging around and watching them drill when suddenly the head of the punk squad just punches one of the other punk squad members right in the face. And everyone watching was just shocked. This was a message to the other members that the no violence policy was just a thing of the past and that this was what the new Synanon was gonna look like. And things would just escalate from there. Chuck started preaching that parents should just hit their kids to keep them in line. Some kids were sent to different locations, mostly the Synanon facility in Badger, California, and they were treated terribly there. They were forced to live outside in tents, and these were not nice tents. These were like your standard run-of-the-mill little camping tents. Like, if it rained outside, you were gonna get wet. They were just neglected and forgotten. It became totally normal for children in the group to just be physically abused on a regular basis. So Synanon's word for teacher was demonstrator. That's what they called their teachers. So instead of the demonstrators, making the kids, you know, do push-ups or taking privileges away. Now, if a kid acted up, they were, they were beaten and almost always in front of the other children. Some of these kids had been members of Synanon their entire lives. As weird and mentally messed up as this place was, it had never been physical. And now suddenly the demonstrators were just abusing the children on a regular basis. And this would almost always be done in front of the other children. Chuck eventually formed the Girls and Boys Corps, which as far as I can tell, it seems to be loosely modeled after the punk squad. Boys and girls from all across the different locations were handpicked and then put on buses and sent to Tamales Bay to start the training in the Corps. They would wake up at 5 a.m. They would have to run sometimes up mountains. And if the kids got out of breath and slowed down, they would be beaten in front of everyone. A man named Buddy Jones was in charge of the physical education for the Synanon kids. Some of the former members remember Buddy being nicer to certain kids and if he didn't like you he would lose his temper on you really fast. Most of the kids were just terrified of him. The kids were also constantly warned against splitting which is the term that Synanon had for when someone left the community. The Tamales Bay location was pretty isolated. It was more of a country setting so it wasn't around like the hustle and bustle of a big city and in that same area of Tamales Bay where Synanon was located there was a nearby ranch that was ran by the Gambanini family. Since the Gambanini Ranch was so close to the Synanon facility, Chuck worried that if some of the kids tried to split, they would run to the Gambanini's house for help. So to make sure that the kids didn't try to escape and run there for help, they were told that the Gambaninis were psychotic and they would catch kids and torture them and then kill them, all this crazy stuff just to scare them into ever going over there. One day up at the Tamales Bay location, an afternoon meeting was called and the members of the girls' corps and the boys' corps and some of the permanent residents of Tamales Bay were all out at this meeting. Buddy Jones was also there and a man named Rod Mullen, who was the head of the basic training in Synanon. And they were both standing up at the front of the meeting. Then two boys were brought out in a truck and it was announced to everyone that these two boys had tried to split and they had been caught by some of the other Synanon members. The two boys were then pulled out of the truck and then brutally beaten in front of everyone. And of course, this was just supposed to send a message to the other kids that they should never try to leave. On another occasion, a young girl was caught trying to escape one of the Synanon locations. All of the people, including the children, were woken up randomly in the middle of the night and they were told to get dressed and come downstairs. When everyone came downstairs, they saw this young girl just kind of standing off by herself in the room. So once everyone kind of settled into the room, one of the Synanon adults, gets up and announces that this girl had tried to split and she had got caught and brought back to the facility. Then the girl's father was brought up and he just started screaming at her in front of everyone and saying that he was ashamed that she was even his daughter. Then after he was done yelling at her, he was handed a paddle and he was told that he needed to beat her in front of everyone. So he took the paddle and he braced his daughter so she didn't fall forward from the force. Then he proceeded to repeatedly beat her on her bottom with the paddle. And this went on for a very long time. And finally, once he was done, one of the other Synanon adults walked over to the girl and grabbed her hand and held it up like she had just won 
a fight or something. Then all of the adults in the room just started like clapping and cheering, but the children were completely silent. They were horrified by what they had just seen. Then all the kids were told that if they tried to run away, that they should think of this and know that next time it will be worse. One of the former Synanon members who talked about this whole thing said that the girl just looked completely broken by the time the whole thing was over. Then another time, three young teenage girls from the girls' corps in Tamales Bay location, they ran away and these girls ran straight to the police station to tell them what was going on. And when they finally you know, told the police everything, the police weren't really surprised. Synanon was kind of becoming pretty known to the police at this point and two of the girls ended up getting on the phone and calling their parents to come pick them up because their parents were not involved in the cult itself they were on the outside but one girl julie had no one to call and so the only person she could think of was her mother but her mother was a synanon member she was just at a different location julie had no one else to call so she calls her mom so her mom came to pick her up and then she drove her right back to the Tamales Bay location. Julie was finally eventually released to her father. Her father was not a member of Synanon. She hadn't seen him in years. He finally did get custody of her and she was allowed to leave. Chuck finally just let her go because he was just sick of dealing with her trying to escape all the time. She was definitely more defiant and so he was just kind of done with her. So he did let her leave and she ended up living with her father. And Julie was only 14 years old at this point. So she had been through a lot. And after she left, she she did speak out about all the stuff that was going on in Synanon. And she wasn't the only one. The Gambaninis also spoke out. So I mentioned the Gambanini family earlier. They had actually started out as friends with Chuck and with some of the members of Synanon. Their names were Alvin and Doris Gambanini, and they lived there on their ranch with their three children. And Chuck would invite them over for dinner. They would hang out. The Gambaninis would give Chuck tips on ranching since, you know, their family had been doing it for years. They even would like give them animals sometimes and help them with farming. So it started out as this really friendly relationship. But as time went on, things started to change. Chuck and the other members started to act a little standoffish. The Gambaninis started seeing weird things too. There were lots of young teenage kids that were always running away from the property. Then towards the mid 70s, some of the teenagers from Synanon started showing up on their doorstep and they would ask them for food and ask them for help because they were being abused at the Synanon facility. And Alvin and Doris would report that these kids were not dressed properly, they were hungry and dirty, and a lot of them just looked like they had just been broken. They would invite the kids inside their home, they would feed them and give them whatever they could. They even took some of them to the bus station and gave them money so that they could get back home to their parents. And remember, they had been told that the Gambaninis would murder them, but these kids took their chance and still went over there anyway, so that tells you how desperate they were. Some of the families of these kids wrote back to the Gambaninis once their kids finally made it home and they thanked them for helping their kid to escape. But there were some families who drove to the Gambanini's house to pick up their kids and then drove them straight back to Synanon. When Alvin would call the local sheriff to report the abuse of the children, he was warned that he could get in trouble for aiding runaways. He was essentially just hung up on. But this wasn't actually really a surprise to Alvin because some of the Synanon members were actually volunteer sheriffs. So Synanon had officially infiltrated the police department and this was definitely by design. One of the other neighbors even wrote to the governor to tell him what was going on with these kids at Synanon, but there was never any response. And eventually the relationship between the Gambaninis and Synanon just completely broke down. And then one night in 1975, things all kind of came to a head. Alvin and Doris were driving their three children home from a meeting that they had had in town that night. Alvin was driving, their 10 year old daughter Alvina was in the front seat in the middle of Doris and Alvin. And then in the back seat was 15 year old Bob and 13 13 year old Doreen. Now before they went home, they were supposed to go by a neighbor's house, the Cabral's. They had went on vacation and their son Victor decided not to go with them. So they had asked the Gambaninis to just kind of go to their house periodically to check on him. So that's what they were doing. Before they went home, they were gonna go check on Victor. Now the Cabral's shared a property line with Synanon. And as Alvin and his family were driving down the road, headed toward the Cabral house, 
they came to a point where they needed to turn around. And when they went to turn around, they saw a huge army truck full of people. And there were other cars too that had people in it. All of these people had shaved heads. And the Gambaninis immediately knew that these were sending on people. The members just started surrounding their car. Alvin had had his window rolled down at the time. So some of the members were just reaching their hands into his car and just beating him in the head and trying to pull him out of the car. But Doris, she had a hold of Alvin and she wasn't letting go. And she started trying to block his face so that they couldn't hit him. One of the Synanon people tried to grab the keys out of the ignition, but Doris stopped them before they could get them. Then some of the other members got into another car and just started ramming the Gambanini's car. It was just absolute chaos. Now in all of the commotion, Bob, the 15 year old that's in the back seat, he had managed to slip out and he was gonna try to go get help. He took off straight to the Cabral's house. He was gonna go get Victor to see if they could do something. So he runs to Victor's house and he knocks on the door. And when Victor opens it up, Bob is just frantic. And he tells Victor everything that's going on. They jump into Victor's car and they head over to go see what they can do to help. As they were approaching the Gambanini's car, they couldn't even see it anymore. That's how many Synanon people were on top of the car. They had completely swarmed it. Then at some point, some of the members noticed Victor and Bob and they started coming towards them. Victor threw the car in reverse and he just floored it and headed back to his house so that they could call for help. Victor and Bob did manage to make it back to the Cabral house and they called the sheriff. Thankfully, all of the Gambaninis and Victor did survived that night, but Alvin was seriously injured when the cops finally showed up. But Chuck was very happy with what had happened with Gambaninis. To him, it was the ultimate show of loyalty from his people. Some of the members did end up going to jail for a short time after all this happened. And when they were released, they were promoted by Chuck for doing such a great job with Alvin Gambanini. Chuck had surrounded himself with blind loyalists whose sole purpose in life was to please him. And this was the new Synanon. The organization is composed of what Synanon calls dope fiends, squares, and delinquent children, punks. Synanon educates, clothes, and feeds its members. And in return, most of them turn over their personal wealth and work for Synanon. The organization has become a self-contained cradle-to-grave society with $33 million in assets. Chuck decided that no one should ever be allowed to come on Synanon property without being stopped and forced into an interrogation. And anyone who would show up on the property, a Hey Rube would be called. And this is the name that Chuck gave to the alert that was called when someone like an outsider showed up on the property. For example, one newlywed couple, named Tom and Donna pulled up to one of the Synanon locations. And Tom had actually once been a member of Synanon. He had an addiction problem and Synanon is what had saved him. He just wanted to show Donna, you know, the place that had helped him to get clean. They pulled onto the property and they were just gonna sit for a second just so she could see the facility. And then when they went to turn around to leave, they were blocked in by Synanon people. The members got out of their cars and then walked up to Tom's car and they recognized him immediately. They pulled him out of the car and then beat beat him so badly he couldn't walk and then he was told never to return. There were other times where people would show up on the property and then the Synanon people would grab them up, throw them in the back of a truck, beat the hell out of them, and then just dump them off somewhere. One morning, two surfers were pulled from their vans and beaten by Synanon because they had unknowingly slept overnight in their parked car on Synanon property. And there are so many other stories just like this. Then in 1977, something would happen that would lead to the downfall of Synanon. So a woman named Terry was living in Santa Monica, California with her husband, Ed, and the two were still newlyweds. Terry had been suffering with depression and anxiety for a while, but at this point, it just had really taken a turn for the worse and she was struggling just to make it day to day. On the morning of June 6th, 1977, Terry dropped her husband Ed off at work and then she headed over to the Venice Family Planning Clinic to see if she could get some help with her depression. Once she got there, a counselor, a woman named Shirley Goldstein told Terry, they don't treat mental health issues at that facility. They were specifically involved in family planning, but she told Terry that she knew just the place that she needed to go to get help for her depression. And that place was Synanon. Turns out that Shirley and her husband, Dr. Charlie Goldstein were Synanon donors, and they were both very much believers in Synanon. Terry was just so desperate for help. At this point, she would pretty much try anything. So she headed for the Del Mar Club location in Santa Monica. Terry would later say that she remembers that there was a person standing outside of the Del Mar 
Mar Club when she got there and they were warning her not to go in because she would never come back out. But Terry went in anyway. And once she was inside, she was brought into a room and she was asked a few questions. And witnesses say that Terry seemed completely spaced out. The members asked Terry if she wanted help and she said yes. Then they asked her if she was going to obey all orders and she said yes. Then without warning, one of the members came up behind Terry and started shaving her head. Now Terry had long hair, like it was past her waist. And this sent her into what was described as a semi-psychotic state. She just completely freaked out when they did this. That night, Terry was dragged across the street to what the members called the clump, which were Synanon apartments that were right across from the main facility. She was put in a room with several other Synanon members and she was locked in. Terry kept asking to call her husband to let him know where she was and she was told that she couldn't. And then she asked to leave and she was told that she couldn't. The next day, Terry was put in the kitchen and she was told to chop vegetables, but she wasn't cooperating. So one of the other women in the group was assigned to be her buddy. And when Terry wouldn't cooperate, her buddy got annoyed and she grabbed Terry by the wrist and she just started dragging her all around the facility. And Terry ended up getting bruises because of this. Then on Terry's third day at Synanon, she was put on a bus and sent to Tamales Bay. And once she was there, she was forced to sleep outside in a tent. And when Terry would ask to speak to her husband, the other members would just tell her that her husband knew where she was. He just didn't care. He didn't love her anymore. He didn't even want her anymore. She was also forced to play the Synanon game. And this was absolutely terrible for someone in Terry's fragile state. She was being screamed at and yelled at and all of her worries and insecurities were being put on display by the other members during the game. This just got to be too much for Terry and she started having blackouts because of all the stress. Now back in Santa Monica, Ed had been frantically searching for his wife. And after asking around, he ended up finding out that she had walked into Synanon that day she disappeared. So Ted went to Synanon and demanded that Terry be released. But once he was in there, he was told that he couldn't see her and he couldn't even talk to her. And he was told that he needed to leave. So Ted did leave, but he went straight to the police station to tell them what was going on. But he was told that since Terry was over 18, she could do whatever she wanted and they refused to get involved. Then a friend recommended that Ted call a lawyer named Paul Morantz. And Paul is a hero in this case. So Ted calls Paul to tell him everything. And Paul immediately puts a plan into action to get Terry out of Synanon. His first idea was to simply just call the health department to have them go down to Synanon and check things out because he thought they were a licensed facility and he knew that there were certain laws and regulations that they had to follow and they were obviously breaking some of them, you know, by holding Terry there. So Paul calls the health department, but that's when he finds out that Synanon was not licensed. Remember from part one, that Synanon bill that said that they were exempt from licensing? Yeah, so the health department couldn't get involved. And Paul also learned that Chuck had banned anyone from the health department from ever stepping foot on Synanon property. So Paul had to come up with some other plan. He somehow managed to get Synanon to agree to one phone call between Ted and Terry. Paul was actually on the line while this call was happening. So Ted asked Terry, if she wanted to leave. And she finally did say, yes, she wanted to leave. And as soon as Paul heard that, he jumped on the line and he was like, okay, you heard that. She said she wants to leave. You have to release her now. And after more back and forth between Synanon and Paul, he finally did get them to agree to release Terry under the condition that Ted and Paul sign a release that would free Synanon from any liability. So Paul agrees to this because at this point, their main goal is to just get Terry out of there. So they set up a date to meet at the Del Mar Club in Santa Monica and Ted and Paul and Paul's friend were going to go down there and pick Terry. Up. but she would have to be bussed back over from the Tamales Bay facility. So every Synanon facility had a lobby when you walked in. So the plan was that as soon as Terry walked out into the lobby, Ted was gonna go walk over to her and slowly and calmly walk her straight out the door and into his car and then he was gonna drive away while Paul was keeping everyone else distracted with all the legal stuff. They would also have Ted's friend present as well and he would signal to Paul as soon as Ted and Terry had gotten in the car and driven away. And this is exactly what they did. And Ted did safely get Terry and he put her in the car and he did drive away. So while Paul is up at the front dealing with all the, you know, the legal stuff, the liability waiver, they ran into an issue. Paul hadn't brought any legal documents with him and Synanon hadn't prepared any either, but Synanon needed that signature. They weren't gonna let Paul leave until they had it. Paul's like, okay, well, what if I write one out for you? And they, you know, they said that that would be fine. Paul writes out this liability waiver 
and he signed it and he handed it to the Synanon people and then he gave them the finger and turned around and left. And what Paul had actually written on this legal document was that Synanon was released from all liability for removing Terry from Synanon, not that they were released from liability for forcing her to stay in Synanon, which had been the original deal. So this document was completely worthless and it didn't protect Synanon from anything. So two days after Terry was rescued, Paul did file a lawsuit against Synanon for false imprisonment, battery, and brainwashing. Terry was in a catatonic state by the time Ted got her back home, and he did end up having to put her into a hospital, and she did eventually recover. Paul wasn't done with Synanon yet, though. He started tracking down recent splittees and helping them speak out, and he really got to hear all about Chuck and about Synanon and all the hell that had broke loose inside that organization. He also helped other people get their children out of Synanon as well. And oh man, Chuck did not like this. He hated Paul Morantz. His attentions were momentarily diverted from Paul when on December 9th, 1977, a reporter from Time Magazine came to the Badger Synanon location to do an interview with Chuck. At this point, Chuck really thought that he was on his way to winning the Nobel Prize. So when this reporter from Time Magazine reached out to him, his first thought was that he was going to be nominated Time Magazine's Man of the Year. But this is not what happened. And Chuck was furious when the issue came out because not only was he not Man of the Year, but the article essentially exposed Synanon for what it actually had become. And they said they were just another kooky cult. And Chuck was livid. He immediately set his legal team in action on this and they sued Time Magazine. Then Synanon sent out a press release, which quoted Chuck saying, when any news outlet gets out of line with us, we will do everything we can to punish it. Don't tread on me. Our country is built on that premise and so is Synanon. And now the holy war had begun. At the beginning of 1978, Synanon would make the largest arms purchase in the history of California. Chuck spent over $60,000 on guns and ammo, including armor piercing bullets. And soon all these people in Synanon were carrying guns. The president of Synanon, Ron Cook, even started wearing a gun into the game. And a lot of people did not like this. Again, the game is supposed to be a place you can go and say, whatever you want. And it had already taken a huge hit, but now people are going to start wearing guns into the game. Chuck said about getting all of his people trained up on using these firearms. And they even started having these barbecues on Sundays that they called the shoot. And people would come and eat barbecue and learn how to shoot a gun. And a campaign to terrorize the Times and its writers was set into motion. There were bomb threats called in. Chuck also went on at least two different TV interviews and straight up threatened the Times employees. He basically started talking about how he wasn't responsible for what his cult members might do. Of course, he didn't call him a cult because he didn't believe that's what he was. He said, quote, I have no way of being responsible for what they might do. I don't know what actions they might take against the people responsible, their wives, their children. I just don't know. And I have no way of being responsible for it. Bombs could be thrown into odd places, into the homes of some of the clowns who occupy high places in the Times organization. That's too bad. That's too bad. I would certainly not institute anything like that, but I have no way of preventing it if it would happen. Totally invoking some sort of violent uprising here and not only towards the Times writers, which is just bad enough, but also their spouses and their children. And when the interviewer, Jesse Marlowe from NBC pointed out that this sounded like a threat to the Times magazine, Chuck said, well, actually, I think it's pretty decent of me to warn them to be careful. Chuck ended up suing the Times. He also sued ABC and the Hearst Corporation. And he actually won some of these lawsuits and he broke records for the largest payout in history. In 1978, Synanon purchased an apartment building called the Boston House, which was right by the White House. Despite all of the negative press that Synanon and Chuck had been receiving, he still thought that he deserved a place in the political arena. And he wanted to rub shoulders with people that he called the big boys because of all the success that Synanon had had in the drug rehab days. So he bought this Boston house to try to be closer to all of the political action. And Chuck was eventually invited to come have lunch at the White House. But when he got there, he was very disappointed when he found out that he would not be eating lunch in the Oval Office. He would be eating in the staff cafeteria. He was not happy about this. And it was around this time that the Washington DC police got word from the FBI that Synanon had made the largest gun purchase in the history of California. So this coupled with all the stuff that Chuck was saying about all these different media outlets and basically, you know, threatening them with bombs and violence and stuff, it was
was very concerning, and it made the authorities take a closer look into Synanon, and soon they were under investigation. Then one day while Chuck was out walking, a photographer from the Washington Post tried to take a photo of him, and Chuck didn't want him to, so he hit him with his cane. Assault charges were pressed against Chuck, but before anything could really happen with that, Chuck and 12 of his closest members fled to Italy. And this is where Chuck's 20 plus years of sobriety came to an end and he started heavily drinking again. A word of Chuck's drinking got back to the members in the States. And a lot of the people that knew Chuck best knew that this was not good. They knew that Chuck couldn't do anything in moderation and they knew that this was gonna be bad. So there were several members that actually left around this time. Chuck and the other members eventually came back to the States and he just continued to drink heavily. And of course, Synanon has just been this like years long game of follow the leader. So everyone started to follow Chuck's lead and everyone started drinking. Now this wasn't really a problem for the squares. They didn't have any sort of addiction issues, but the members of Synanon who did have addiction problems and that was the whole reason they were in Synanon to begin with, it had a devastating effect on them. Some of them did decide to leave when Chuck started drinking again because they knew that this wasn't gonna end well. But the people who had addiction issues and did decide to stay, they struggled. They fell right back into their old ways. And some of them had hepatitis C. So when they started heavily drinking again, some of them died. Chuck started hosting parties again at Synanon, the Saturday parties, except this time, drinking was allowed and these were crazy parties. Some of the former members that were children at this time said that they would stand on the balcony and they would watch their parents in these parties and they would be completely wasted and they just said it was like just the most embarrassing thing ever. So Synanon was making headlines for all the wrong reasons around this time and the more the media and the public turned on Chuck, the more unhinged he became. This eventually led to Chuck forming his very own military group, which he called the Imperial Marines. The Imperial Marines were essentially just a paramilitary group that Chuck wanted to train to be ready for combat. They even had their own form of martial arts called Sindo. The Imperial Marines were stationed at the Badger location and that's where they were put through their boot camps. They would camp out overnight in this area in Badger and they would catch rattlesnakes. Sometimes they would eat the rattlesnakes and they would go on these training missions where they would have people come in and try to attack them as practice for when this actually happened. At this point, he was coming over the wire almost constantly. And he would tell people that anyone who talked bad about Synanon needed to pay. At this point, the broadcast from the wire was piped into every room in every facility. That includes bedrooms and bathrooms as well. So there's literally no escaping these broadcasts. And Chuck was on the wire all the time. And he's talking about hurting this person and that person for messing with Synanon. Chuck just became increasingly more paranoid. And he was quoted saying, don't fuck with Synanon in any way. I think that is our new religious posture. Don't mess with us. You can get killed dead, physically dead. And one name that seemed to come up a lot over the wire was Phil Ritter. Remember Phil from part one? He's the man who left when all the vasectomies were happening and he had tried to go to the police to tell them what was happening. Well, Chuck hated Phil for what he did. When Phil was kicked out of Synanon, his family were actually still members. He had a wife and a young daughter that were still in Synanon and he had to leave them behind when he was kicked out. Now, by 1978, Phil was living in Berkeley, California and he was roommates with this woman and her two young children who were all former Synanon members. He was in a pretty messy custody battle with his wife, Lynn, over their daughter and Lynn and their daughter were still in the cult at this point. Phil's lawyers had thrown out threats to subpoena Chuck and force him to testify about all the violence and stuff that had been happening within Synanon and Chuck did not want this to happen. And this just put an even bigger target on Phil Ritter. After they threatened Chuck with the subpoena, Phil ended up getting a visit from two Synanon members and they threatened to hurt him if he went through with the subpoena. Then on the night of September 21st, 1978, Phil drove up to his home after getting groceries. And as he stepped out of his car to unload his groceries, he was approached by two guys with stockings over their faces and clubs in their hands. And they began brutally beating Phil right there on the driveway. One of Phil roommate's little boys was standing at the front door watching this all happen. Apparently this little boy had grown attached to Phil and he would wait for Phil to come home. And that's what 
what he had been doing. He had seen Phil pull up and he was waiting at the door to greet him. And instead, he watched this violent attack on Phil. And that little boy was Mikel Jolet, and he is actually the front man of the band The Airborne Toxic Event. He also wrote a book called Hollywood Park about his experience in Synanon as a child, and he talks all about witnessing Phil being beaten almost to death by Synanon members. This was a murder attempt. The only reason the two men stopped beating Phil is because a passerby walked up and saw what was happening and they just started screaming. Phil did survive, but he ended up in a coma for a while. He also had a broken arm, a broken leg, and a fractured skull. And he was not expected to pull through. But thankfully, he did survive, but he did have a long road to recovery. Chuck talked a lot about Paul over the wire, about how much he hated him and how much he wished something bad would happen to him. He talked about ripping his arm off and beating him with it, essentially invoking some sort of uprising against Paul Morantz. The Butler kids had been left behind in Synanon when their mother had died of cancer and then their father just left. So the kid's grandmother had started hearing some stuff about Synanon being involved in some abuse of children and she wanted her grandkids out. So she reached out to Paul Morantz and since now he had a reputation for helping people, she knew that he would be the person to help her. So Paul did end up helping to get the Butler kids out of the cult. The grandmother arranged for a visit at the San Francisco location and Paul went to the police and they had them show up during the visit. They swarmed Synanon and they released the Butler kids to their grandmother. And this became national news. One of the Butler kids was 15 years old and he heard all of the talk about killing Paul over the wire. So he ended up calling Paul to warn him about it. There was a point I realized that I crossed the point of no return, that I was gonna survive, or Synanon was gonna survive, but it wasn't gonna be the both of us. And uh, it was a very terrible and horrible feeling. On October 10th, 1978, around 5.30 p.m., just a few weeks after the attack on Phil, Paul Morantz arrived at his home in Pacific Palisades, and he was excited to watch the first game of the World Series. Paul walked into his home, he greeted his dogs, and then he put his stuff down on the counter. And as he started to walk towards his bedroom, he noticed an oblong-shaped package in his mailbox. Paul had one of those mailboxes that had a slot on the outside where you could drop stuff in, and it would land into another box with a grill on it on the inside of the house. So Paul walked over to the mailbox and he lifted the lid with his right hand and reached in to pull out the package with his left hand. And that's when a four foot rattlesnake struck Paul's left wrist. He immediately let out a really loud scream and he knew he had to think fast. His dogs had been outside. He had let them out whenever he had walked in, but he could see them running towards the house once they heard him scream, they were coming to check out what was going on. So he knew he needed to make sure his dogs couldn't get inside. So as he's going to close this door so the dogs can't come in, the rattlesnake is right between him and this door. But as any true dog owner would, he took his chances and he went over and he reached over the snake and he shut the door so his dogs couldn't get in. Now Paul knew immediately that Synanon was responsible for this. He ran out of the side door and he yelled for his neighbor to help and call an ambulance and he said Synanon had got him. On the way to the hospital, Paul made sure to tell anyone who would listen that this was a murder attempt by Synanon. He knew there was a chance that he wasn't going to survive, so he wanted to make sure that everyone knew who was behind them. Paul did survive that attack, and he spoke out in the media and accused Synanon of being responsible. And this was all over the news. And it stayed in the news until about a month after the attack when the Jonestown mass suicide happened. This kind of took over the news for a while. Well, the bodies of at least 409 men, women, and children, some shot to death, most apparently self-poisoned, have been found at the Guyana jungle camp of People's Temple. Some of the supplies, including the Kool-Aid that the Jonestown members drank, had actually been provided by Synanon a few weeks earlier. Synanon would periodically send Jonestown supplies from the states when they moved to Guyana. Some people started to worry that Chuck might have the capacity to do something like what Jim Jones had done. So the pressure was really put on Paul Morantz to really get the word about Synanon and take them down. Now, after Paul had been removed from the home, taken to the hospital, there were some people that came into the house to find the rattlesnake and kill it. And that's what they did. They found that the rattle had actually been taken off of the snake before it had been dropped into the mailbox. And this obviously had been done on purpose so that Paul wouldn't hear the snake before he reached in. A snake expert was called to examine the snake and it was determined that this particular type of rattlesnake 
was not local to this area. Then people kind of started putting the pieces together that the Imperial Marines were likely involved in this. So I mentioned earlier that the Imperial Marines were trained at the Badger location. Now this particular location in Badger was known to have a lot of rattlesnakes and the Imperial Marines would often hunt these rattlesnakes and sometimes they would even eat them. They would do this a lot when they were doing their wilderness training. So now there is at least some sort of connection between Synanon and the attack on Paul Morantz. So one of Paul Morantz's neighbors had actually seen a vehicle there at his house on the day of the attack. The men were driving a 1973 green four-door Plymouth. The men had put something in Paul Morantz's mailbox. He noticed that this car had tape over the license plate. Somehow this neighbor did figure out the actual license plate number and he wrote it down. So when all this stuff happened with Paul, he handed over all this information and the police ran the license plate. And when they did, they determined that this car was registered to the Synanon Foundation. And in late 1978, a raid was conducted on the Badger location and they confiscated tons of recordings from the wire. Police started listening to just hours and hours of Chuck's ramblings over the wire. And they found a lot of evidence that would suggest that he had something to do with the attack on Paul Morantz. They found one report called October is the month of the hunt. October being the month that Synanon's enemies would be tracked down and killed. Chuck and the Imperial Marines had prepared a hit list of people that they viewed as enemies of Synanon. And by 1978, there were eight people on that list and Phil Ritter and Paul Morantz were at the top. When the raid was executed, Chuck wasn't even at the property. He had actually fled to Lake Havasu in Arizona and he went there with some of his closest members. He was living in a small house near some hotels and apartments that he had bought. And he was actually thinking about starting completely over at this location. And while he was there, he was still drinking very heavily and he had just fallen right back into his old ways of drinking himself into a stupor. But the authorities had found all the evidence they needed to arrest Chuck for conspiracy to commit murder. And on December 2nd, 1978, Chuck's home in Lake Havasu was raided and he was arrested. He was so drunk when they found him that they had to bring him out on a stretcher. The LAPD was using the hit list that they found to really build a case against Chuck and Synanon. And in 1980, the case finally went to court and Chuck pleaded no contest and took a plea deal. Chuck at this point was in really poor health. And so Paul just decided to just let Chuck take this plea deal. And the whole thing was he didn't have to serve any jail time, but he had to step down from Synanon permanently. And it was discovered that the two men who had actually put the snake in the mailbox were Joe Musico and Lance Kenton. And they were both Imperial Marines. Lance and Joe were given one year in jail for the murder attempt on Paul Morantz. And it was also later discovered that Joe Musico and another member of the Imperial Marines had been responsible for the Phil Ritter attack in his driveway. And a little side note here, Phil Ritter was eventually reunited with his wife and daughter after they left Synanon and he and his wife Lynn got back together and they're still married to this day. After Chuck was ordered to step down from Synanon, his daughter became the leader, but Chuck still lived there on the property. Chuck's mental and physical health really started to suffer at this point, and a lot of people started to leave. In the late 80s, the IRS had finished up their own investigation into Synanon. They had started looking into things as well, and the IRS found that Synanon owed $55 million in back taxes. And this is what finally ended Synanon. February 28, 1997, Chuck Dietrich died at the age of 83 of heart and lung failure. Paul Morantz also passed away on October 23rd, so just very recently. He lived with lifelong issues as a result of the snake bite, but he remained committed to educating people on the dangers of cults through his books and interviews over the years. Through his research, he documented 87 separate incidents of random violence from Synanon against the public between the years of 1974 and 1978. Today, there are still remnants of Synanon out there and it exists in the form of the Troubled Teen Program. SEDU is one of these places, which I've seen a lot of people say that they believe SEDU actually stands for Charles Edwin Diedrich University because it's spelled C-E-D-U. It was founded by a former Synanon member named Mel Wasserman. There's a lot of Synanon-like themes to this place. There are reports of abuse and neglect within groups like this, and it's still going on today. So many people initially joined Synanon because they saw the beauty in it. They saw the racial integration when so much inequality was happening in the world. 
They saw heroin addicts going in and kicking their habits and becoming these entirely new people with positive outlooks on life. And they saw this amazing community of people who leaned on each other and supported each other when they needed it the most. What it became was something so ugly and disturbing and just something so far from the original vision. We are an experimental society. I don't know how this is going to come out. I really don't. If I knew how it was going to come out, I would do it. And what I've given you is a pretty in-depth overview, but seriously, there are so many good books and lots of forums and podcasts that have so much more information. And a lot of it is firsthand accounts of former members. So if you are interested in digging deeper into this case, just check my description box and I always link all of my sources there and I'll have a long list of links to help you fall down the same rabbit hole that I did. If you found this video interesting, please consider subscribing to my channel. I upload content just like this every other Sunday. Thanks again to MD Hair for sponsoring this video and don't forget to check the description box or the comments for the link to get 70% off using my code SUMMER70. Thank you so much for watching this video and for hanging out with me today. I'll see you next time.